Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for joining us for Ask Me Anything session today uh, at Communitech. We are working hard to bring you business as virtual as much as possible while supporting our members the best way we can. My name uh, is Ian McDonald. I am the Chief Customer Officer at Communitech. I'm very excited to have uh, very, two very esteemed panelists with us today here to answer your questions as we discuss why we need to expand our concept of intellectual property beyond technical IP in isolation, but rather to view the role and the value of technical market and process IP together. Before I introduce Alexis and Charles, I have a few housekeeping items as you'd expect that I need to cover. Uh, first is a reminder that this session is being uh, recorded uh, so it can be shared at a later date as a resource for our companies. You can find all of our AMA recordings at communitech.ca. Second, there are a few controls that should be in the top right hand of your screen uh, that you can use to customize how you view the panelists and experience the session today. In terms of the AMA, we've had a ton of questions submitted in advance, which is great. Uh, we'll, we'll make for a terrific conversation today. We invite you to contribute to the discussion with more questions by using the Q&A function. You'll see that at the bottom of the screen. We'll cover as many questions as we can in our limited time together. Last, uh, if you're interested in following up after the session or to discuss this topic further, please connect with your Communitech advisor or your customer success manager, and they can connect you with Charles or Alexis. Uh, and also, uh, please check your Week in Tech or your Start and Scale newsletters. Uh, that's where you'll find a list of upcoming AMA sessions. So with that, on with the session and with our experts, uh, first, Alexis Conrad Black uh, is deeply passionate about her role as an IP advisor and educator with the Canadian government at the Canadian Intellectual Property Office. In 2018, her contributions earned her a Deputy Minister's Award of Merit for the programming developed specifically for IP education in Canada. Recently, Alexis was recognized as the only trailblazer from Canada in World IP Review's Influential Women in IP for 2020. So those are both some, some significant distinctions. Charles Plant is a serial entrepreneur. He's an innovation economist, a university lecturer, as well as a consultant. Probably he's most well known as the founder of the Narwhal Project, where he conducts research in what it takes to create world-class tech companies. Charles has written more than 35 research papers, including a book entitled Triggers and Barriers, A Customer Perspective on Innovation, and he's currently working on a second book, Unicorn Math, de Developing an Algorithm for Rapid Growth. Now, Charles and Alexis, before we get into the questions, can you expand a bit on your backgrounds and perspectives uh, as we get into the conversation today? Alexis, do you wanna go first? Sure. Um, I, I guess my perspective and my background is I've been with Siegel for the past five year, five and a quarter years. Prior to that, I worked for two of Canada's largest uh, corporate law firms, uh, both of which uh, still have a significant contribution in the IP space. Um, my job there basically was to help, um, especially at the first firm I was with, to help them expand on their intellectual property client business. So I became intimately familiar with uh, educational materials and what we were doing to try to encourage more people to participate in the subject matter. Um, at the time, I was really encouraged by some thought leaders that worked at both of those firms to kind of follow my passion to figure out exactly what entrepreneurs, uh, founders and innovators and executives were looking for and what they needed. Sometimes they didn't always know when it came to IP business strategy education. And uh, thanks to a couple of those individuals, I was convinced to take a job um, or to apply for a job at the Canadian Intellectual Property Office where I am today, uh, where my goal was to use a non-biased lens to help um, educate Canadian innovators and founders and executives on IP business strategy specifically, which is what I do today. So my perspective tends to come from a non-biased lens um, and as well as from an overall uh, betterment of our innovation economy. That really is our end goal at the end of the day through IP in Canada. Oh, very valuable, Alexis. That's certainly from my experience, uh, you know, in, in early stage companies uh, and, and doing a fair amount of IP work myself in those companies, 
um, value, very much value that experience. So thank you for your time today. Charles, over to you. So, you know, I, I, I tell us every time I give a talk, I, I spent 15 years as a, a co-founder and CEO of a company called Synamics, which built telecommunication software for telcos primarily. The, the uh, It was a moderate success, not a, a great barn burner. And I left there wondering, what what's it take to create a huge company? I mean, we were profitable and growing, but you know, we didn't create that huge entity. And I've, I've worked for more than a dozen companies since then in uh, senior executive roles, investor, director, and officer. I've worked in venture capital and investment banking, all the while trying to figure out what's it take to create these massive uh, successful companies, what Shopify is doing right now. And I, not being able to work for one, I finally said, I'm going to do some research. So I, I spent the last six years doing research into what it takes to create these, uh, to create unicorns, to create large public companies out of the technology that's being created uh, in Canada. And I've gained a whole perspective from talking to hundreds and hundreds of people who are entrepreneurs or venture capitalists, academics, uh, advisors, everybody under the sun. And I've looked at thousands and thousands of companies to figure out what the ingredients are. And so what, I, what I'm bringing to this conversation is a challenge to the status quo, a different way of thinking, a, a different way of framing a lens on the issue of intellectual property than perhaps has been had before. And I'm not trying to create something radically new, but just change the conversation slightly to get people to recognize things that, uh, that are in existence that uh, might be valuable to think about. That's great. Thank you, Charles. Well, and I think I remind everyone, uh, hopefully everyone's had a chance to, to read through the white paper, uh, but it's definitely worth the read is, is really the context for a lot of the discussion that we're going to have today. Um, and we've got lots of people in the session today. So we're, we're up to just under 70 uh, participants in the session. So just a reminder to hit the Q&A button and feel free to add questions as they come up through the session, things that come to mind that uh, you've got access to uh, Alexis and uh, Charles's uh, uh, brains on this, uh, on this subject matter here. So let's start off, um, let's connect this to the white paper. Um, let's frame really a lot of the white paper was uh, this, this redefinition or, or reframing the way that we talk about IP. Charles, can I start with you? Can you give us a bit of a definition over what you described in the paper as market IP and process IP? And why have you added them to technical IP as elements of an IP strategy? So I guess you got to start back. We, we typically think of intellectual property as the as the secrets embodied in the product that you're selling and it can be protected by patents or trade secrets. Uh, I, I, in talking predominantly in this case with venture capitalists, have come to a new appreciation of what the elements of intellectual property are. And it comes down to the question of when venture capitalists look at a company, they look at three things. They look at the product, they look at the market, and they look at the team. Well, when they look at the product, the market, and the team, they're asking the question of, what do you know and, and what is special about what you know? And so they're looking at the product from the lens of uh, how, uh, how it differs from the competition, how you protected it from patents, what regulatory approvals you've achieved. And then you get to market IP. And when they look at the market, what they're looking at is, are you serving a big enough market to create a big company? Uh, do you have an understanding of the market needs that are perhaps different than other people understand? And do you have an understanding of the competitive capabilities and how they meet those market needs that are different than the rest of the market would understand? And the third thing is process IP, and that's do you have the knowledge to scale your technology, which is an element in every type of business to be able to scale it to large enough size to be successful? Do you have the knowledge to take it to the market, the knowledge of the market uh, marketing and sales process and do you have the knowledge as to how to get it financed so those all become elements and it's not so much inventing a new way of, of, of defining IP but recognizing what uh, CIPO says on their very own websites are trade secrets and, and if you look at at the definition that CIPO uses as trade secrets everything I've mentioned there is inherent in the definition so what we're really doing is elevating the concept of trade secrets other than product trade secrets to the same level as, as product or technical IP. 
So instead now of looking at this predominant patent technical IP with subsidiary trade secrets, we're elevating it to the same level and having a bigger, full, more fuller conversation about that. That's excellent. Um, so why don't we why don't we start in uh, in 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 one of the components and uh, and we'll just we'll journey through the experience here. So when we talk about what are some examples of, of process IP when you talk about process IP. You described what it was. Can you give us some examples of of this as it would apply to a, a company? Well, I think you can you can look at old examples and that are really dominant. Uh, Ford didn't invent the car. They, can, they, they entered a market that was saturated with car manufacturers and reinvented the process for making a car. They developed process IP that was world beating. Uh, McDonald's did the same thing with hamburgers. I mean, they didn't invent a better hamburger. In fact, you'd be hard to argue it is um, at times even edible. But what they did was they developed a process to get that to you in the most efficient manner possible and at least cost and thereby you know, brought radical change to the industry. If you look in the more recent technology, you're looking at, at companies like Netflix, which really understood the mailing process with CDs to enable them to get to a market or get to a customer quickly. You're looking at Google's market algorithm, or, or sorry, their pricing algorithm for, um, for ads, or you're looking at Uber's use of financing and the amount of financing that they had to acquire in order to dominate the markets that they chose to dominate. And so those specific processes, uh, the knowledge of those processes that enabled those companies to completely uh, disrupt the industry and change the, the whole nature of our discussions about these major industries. Now, I'll continue on that, that theme then. So IP, intellectual property, includes property as a term. How, uh, how is know-how or process property? Maybe Alexis, you, you can answer this because it gets into the issue of trade secrets and what they are. Um. Well, I think you just have to go back and look at the definition of intellectual property. Um, you know, if we're going to make it really basic, you can basically say it's a creation of the mind. So processes that are in business can be defined as a creation of the mind. So it meets the definition of intellectual property. Um, and regardless of what language we put around it, um, it needs to be protected. So these processes are inherently protected either by formal uh, intellectual property rights that you can apply for or register for, um, or they're protected by contracts that you build them up around. So I don't know, does that answer your question, Ian? It does. I think, you know, in the definition to process IP, because we, again, if we, we don't elevate it, if we don't think about that some, as something that needs to be protected as property, um, how do you go about protecting this? that as an example of a new form of IP when those are the easy things to, to walk out the door every night? Well, trade secrets or process IP or know-how or whatever it is that we want to call it, there's many ways to protect it. Um, one of the best ways to protect it is if your business has a thorough IP business strategy, your contracts are going to be in line to make sure that that doesn't happen. You're going to have internal communications that make sure your various leaders know exactly what those things are that you're trying to protect so that nobody absentmindedly gives away a secret. Um, there's everything from lock and key to encryption with software, uh, employment contracts, employment language, all sorts of activities that businesses can and should partake in to protect that essentially. Um, and it depends on every business, every business is unique. So there's no set formula on how you would go about doing that. And the uniqueness of how you're going to do it, you really do need to engage counsel for that. Uh, that isn't just something where you can look up online on what you're gonna do for an employment contract is related to IP or what you're gonna do in terms of building up an internal IP uh, committee to make sure these things are locked down. You really do need to be engaging a, a variety, hopefully once you're big enough of professionals to make sure that you're not going to let that walk out the door. Well, it strikes me out of your answer there, Alexis, is three pieces. So one, it's intentional. Two is that it's structural in terms of getting the right advice as it relates to your business, the context that you operate in. And the third one is what are the common pieces? Because I think those are the ones that maybe people don't think enough about communication being an example. Are you talking about this frequently enough with your employees that they understand how important these pieces are? Um, uh, so that's, uh, that's very helpful. Thank you. 
I would even add that a fourth part of it is cultural, right? So if from the top down, if your executive team and your founders, if your leadership isn't saying, okay, we need to adapt an IP culture within what we're doing, maybe marketing, human resources, sales, research and development, even administrative. So governance, accounting, all that stuff. If it doesn't infiltrate from the top down, you're at risk of having things walk out the door. So when I read Charles' paper from my lens, I basically see businesses needing to adapt IP holistically in all departments, in all areas of how they're practicing. And if you look to it, what SIPO has defined as intellectual property, when they, when they talk about trade secrets, which is what I go back to, it's the thing we suggest. And they say a trade secret, and I'm, I'm reading here because I have a terrible memory, a trade secret can be any business information that derives its value from its secrecy. It can be a method, a technique, a process, research and analysis data, a formula, a recipe, a device, an instrument. Trade secrets may be very valuable when you've developed a new technology, designed original products, created the perfect recipe, or put together a gold mine of customer data. So there's always been the intention to include trade secrets in this concept of intellectual property. It's defined by WIPO, it's defined by SIPO, and we're now just elevating the conversation to say you have to marry the, uh, your technical IP with your process and market IP. And if you concentrate just on your product or technical IP to the detriment of the other two, you're not going to succeed as a company in the modern world. Well said, both of you. Wow, that's great. Um, so I'm going to flip uh, to uh, uh, an attendee question as well. Just another another attendee question I want to highlight. And a reminder to folks, uh, please do submit your questions to the Q&A function. This, is, uh, this isn't Ask Me Anything, so we're here to, to take your, your questions. One of the questions came in, Alexis, I think might have been connected to your comments. Um, how do I protect ideas when trying to promote them, trying to get funding? So how do you balance that line between something that's an asset and getting the value out of it while also protecting it? Sorry, can you repeat the question? Absolutely, I can. So it was, how do I protect my ideas while trying to promote them to get funding? Okay. Well, the first step is you've got to educate yourself on intellectual property rights in Canada and abroad. I would say that is the number one thing you need to consider. Uh, and the other thing you need to think about is how those rights that you've educated yourself upon or have gone to, um, you know, patent agents, agent lawyers, uh, IP business strategists, etc. Uh, information that you've gotten from them as well. You need to consider all of that before you do go to market, um, before you do start shopping around your ideas. And there's no cut and paste answer for that. You know, it's, uh, it's a bit of an insurance policy, right? If you don't talk about anything to your market, you know, the risk in that is you're not going to go anywhere with it. But if you do talk about it, your risk is it's going to be taken advantage of. But if you've done the education beforehand, you would know that in certain jurisdictions throughout the world, you have a bit of a grace period of when you can get away with talking about something before you do have to uh, consider public disclosure. So it really depends on what your business strategy is and what you're trying to do and what your relationships are. That's great. Um, can, I, can I build on that question? There's, um, there's two questions that have come in, I think related. I'll, I'll, uh, I'll try not to give you uh, a multiple, uh, multiple uh, question here, load, load it too much. But if I took it apart, you know, A, a what would you, where would you point people who are looking for advice on uh, IP-based funding or, or IP monetization? Where are some of the resources you point people to? Okay, well, obviously when it comes to resources from an educational perspective, the Canadian Intellectual Property Office has a whole wealth of digital tools that people can look at. Other federal departments internally, ranging from BDC to EDC, uh, if you're looking at exports, you're looking at different grants and loans, they've got information as well. There's a whole host of resources. You mentioned earlier the World Intellectual Property Office. I can say that the Intellectual Property Institute of Canada has a whole host, obviously, of professional expertise. Um, the organization is innate to what they're doing there. You can look at a variety of professional firms throughout across the country and international that have their own spin on information that you can access. And then when it comes to funding, there are investors and there are venture capital groups that do invest based on IP and they will cover costs or they will cover future costs. A variety of circumstances depending on 
what they're looking at and, and who they're chasing. And then within government, you know, it, with uh, BBC, uh, Government of Canada, $160 million fund for IP backed um, loans. We, we can take a look at the can export um, businesses or SMEs. It's, you know, backed by NRC. Businesses can use during COVID right now up to $75,000 and 75% of that they can get reimbursed for IP fees that they need to expend in going global into areas where they don't already have a strong existing client base. So there are programs and there are funds available for people to do this. Um, they just need to, they really do need to do some homework. Um, because the information is out there. And I'm not saying it's all on business to find out about that. Um, you know, government and venture capitalists and other people do put this information out there. It's just a matter of um, marrying the two together. So, uh, so the, the, the idea then is that this IP can be an asset, can be a tool, can be a vehicle to get funding, multiple different resources, ways to think about accessing that. A related question, and then we'll move on to the next kind of topic and, and I want to examine market IP, but I think it's an interesting question, which is depending on your funding situation, how, how, would, how should someone think about uh, IP if they can't necessarily afford to de defend it? And uh, it, what would you say to startups who are you know, needing to fund an IP challenge? Okay, so I think we're talking about the question in terms of how expensive it can be to defend and to enforce what you're doing from an IP perspective. So there's a couple of misconceptions surrounding that. There are administrative avenues in most jurisdictions that you can go at it that aren't as expensive as people think. Um, and the opposite side of that, just because you can't afford to enforce it now, it doesn't mean that five years from now, you're not gonna need that right to defend off something else when you can afford it. So if you think about it in terms of building up your fence defensively, right? You may be strategically investing in IP full out knowing that right now and then two years and five years from now, you have no intention of defending it because of expenses. But that doesn't mean you won't be able to and you won't need it because if you don't have it, someone else can use it and get it. Um, and then you have absolutely no grounds to defend it on down the road, even if you do have the money. That's such an important perspective, the time to mention there. Charles, I don't know if you have any other comments to ask, invite you to add on there. Otherwise, we'll move on to talking about market IP. No, I'm good. So uh, can you help us out there, Charles, in terms of we, we spent a bit of time on process IP and then we had a general conversation about some of the, the protection of IP. Can you recap a bit of a definition of market IP and, and give some examples to, to help ground this piece? So, you know, back to the definition, it, it's, un, it's knowing that there's a, a large market in which there is a, 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 an inherent need. It might be defined or it might be very ill-defined need and the, a knowledge of the competition and what they could conceivably do. So if you look at those things, it's, it's an understanding of, the, of your strategy as it relates to the market and competition. There's some really great examples of market IP and how firms have dramatically changed the landscape, disrupted entire industries because of having market IP and staking their, their uh, business on that. And the, the, the first one I, I'll, I'll bring out is Salesforce. And Salesforce came into uh, the customer relationship management business at a time when it was heavily saturated with lots of, uh, of vendors that were competing with in a market that was uh, about well, let's say about $4 billion in size. So it was a fairly good sized market at the time. And uh, they took a completely different stance of it. They recognized there was a need from companies that, that could not afford the existing products. And so they brought in a very stripped down version of the product, made it available through software as a service and created, maybe not originally created, but created the, certainly the best example early on of software as a service. And so in doing that, they had understood the large market. So it was a $4 billion market. I think by the time they went public, it was a $7 billion market, and it's now a $40 billion market annually. And they took a place in that, which went from an absolute startup to a company which is now um, something like 40% of the market and, uh, and $16 billion in size. So really successful at understanding that market. And two recent companies that did that, Uber did it. I mean, you know, they have completely disrupted the transportation market 
not through inventing anything new, but recognizing that consumers wanted a different way to access transportation services and understanding the need of of consumers to transact business on their phones, which hadn't been applied to the taxi business or the rental car business or the subway business. They were able to compete with those businesses in a, in a market that's arguably $5 trillion and completely and radically disrupt that market in, uh, in the matter of, you know, what is it, 10 years or something since they started. And another good one's Airbnb. It's done the same thing. They, they saw a need in the marketplace uh, that others did not see and were able to expand into that. None of them, Airbnb is not complex software. Um, Uber's software is not complex. Salesforce's software was not complex, it might be now. And, but they took a different take on a market and as a result, they were able to succeed really in, in spades. So a number of those examples are, you know, a, a different perspective in a market, not as the market is currently represented, but an understanding of the market as it could be um, related to the solutions of the company. Could you talk a bit about that acquisition process for market IP, either those examples or, or, or point to a different way that, that an organization could do that? Well, I think they each started with a hunch. And the hunch is not really market uh, IP in itself. It, it maybe is a different way of looking at the market, but you haven't acquired any IP if you just start with a hunch and then and that's all you go with. You then have to undertake a really comprehensive process. In the same way as you develop technical IP, you have to develop really comprehensive market IP. And it starts with hiring people who have experience in that market. So you're hiring, you know, if, you, if your end market is gonna be in Europe, then hire Europeans because they're gonna understand the market better. If it's in the US, hire uh, Americans who might understand the market better. Then do market research. And this happens way before the product gets launched. Start to understand the market on, on based on research into how they're buying, why they're buying, and, and all of the dynamics of how they look at the competition and how where the competition is weak, et cetera. Using that research, then you conduct trials. And, and when you look at what venture capitalists finance, they finance a hunch, but the money is used for trials. Their money is used to try out uh, different target markets to, to, to develop product market fit. It's used to try out different marketing um, ways of getting to that market and to obtain marketing efficiency. And so these trials added to the people who are in place add to your understanding of the market and allow you to uh, do something that's completely different than the competition to disrupt them. That's great. Um, I'm gonna pick a, another few uh, attendee questions. Um, Alexis, this one's probably uh, maybe best for you, but open up to both. How do you differentiate as a strong tech firm without a patent portfolio? Well, if you don't have a patent portfolio and you know, you've consulted with experts and it's been decided that you don't have a patent portfolio because what you have isn't patentable, um, you're, you can still use intellectual property to advance yourself from a competitive perspective. Um, intellectual property landscaping, right? It's a common tool that is used across the profession. You think you know yourself, even if you've been in that industry for 10 years, if you haven't gone through the eyes, you figure out, okay, this is where the market's crowded when it comes to intellectual property. But at the end of that exercise, you might find a white gap, an empty space where the market isn't crowded, where there is opportunity. And if you don't have a patent portfolio and there's minimal risk of you know, you, you, you've, you've sought um, risk in terms of prior art that you'd be infringing on and you see that gap, you can still use IP knowledge to execute on a business strategy without formally having patents. Now, you likely want to try to develop formally registered IP within that space, but it's not always entirely needed. Um, and it's a case-by-case -case decision. That, that makes and it starts with education. Sorry, Alexis, keep going. No, it starts with education, right? So part of the process with all of this is executives and leadership teams and boards of directors, they need to make a commitment that IP is going to be a part of what they're working on, all parts of it. Um, and if you get that down, the education becomes 
ingrained in your institution and your organization and these little opportunities of how you can execute will present themselves. There's an attendee uh, who put it in the q and It wasn't really a question, more of a statement, but resonated so much with your earlier point, Alexis, on that uh, around culture um, and the importance of management uh, instilling and repeating that piece. And I think what I take away, Alexis, in addition to uh, on your comments, there's, there's value in the exercise itself and being educated. And Absolutely. Thinking strategy perspective, which so much aligns with what Charles is saying in his white paper as well. It's, it's doing the exercise to, to consider what's there and what your strategy should be as a result. And, you know, if you're going for and financing, like sorry, if you're going for financing, you're going to have to explain that. So you've got to go through that process of understanding uh, your intellectual property and the various different forms of it when it comes down to convincing a venture capitalist to invest. So it's, it, to, to me, it's a, a highly important exercise to really get a handle on that IP before going out to the financing market. Well, and it's not exclusive. Yeah, it's not exclusive to your R&D, right? So another answer to the question earlier about how do you go about this if you don't have patents? Well, you know, sometimes the value when you find those gaps is going after the talent. So if you don't have your, your HR leads and other people around the table, as you adopt intellectual property as a priority for your business, you're going to miss out on those opportunities. Uh, another, uh, another technical question, uh, Alexis, this one comes back to you. And then, uh, and then I think we're ready to connect some of the different concepts we've been talking about. What importance does IP actually hold at a startup versus the application of new tech to novel areas? Doesn't make a whole lot of sense to me. Do you, do you understand the genesis of that question? Yeah. Okay. So let's just think of it in terms of property and real estate. It's an intangible asset. It has a value. May that be a process value. You've got the know-how, right? Trade secret, process IP, or may it be formally registered IP, or may it just be a, a provisional application claiming some territory into an area that you are inventing in. Investors see a value on that. And increasingly, we're seeing private investors assign dollar numbers to it. Um, obviously, there's accounting rules and accounting restrictions. But Ian, if I buy as a business IP from you, I have to, it's no different from a building. So if you're a startup and you're trying to raise capital and you want to improve your valuation, yeah, you've got to talk about these things because if not, you're leaving money behind. So another place where these pieces are, are, are definitely linked together. Charles, did you have something to add there? No, that, that was good. Um, so let's, uh, let's connect a few of the different pieces because I think that's what's coming out of the conversation to me is a whole bunch of linkages about these are not about thinking, thinking about these pieces as pieces, but then thinking about them as a connected whole. So if we were looking across these pieces, something that you explained, Charles, you talked about competitive differentiation and how that relates to market IP, how does that also connect to technical IP? Well, uh, let's go through the process of, of of uh, figuring out your competitive differentiation. So you, you decide you wanna bring a product into a certain market that has a certain set of needs. And you can go through an analysis of the competition and figure out where there are opportunities to create something of higher quality, faster speed or lower cost in some way. And, and in doing that, you craft your strategy as a firm, which is to develop something that is so different from the competition that the consumers wake up and notice it and you have the potential to disrupt. And the, the concept there in, in developing that market IP is to, is to actually develop something with a substantial difference. Because now, and part of the reason we're discussing this, is we've had a significant change in the nature of markets over the last 40 years. We've moved from industrial markets to knowledge-based markets. And in the industrial markets, there were very few competitors. There was a good, better, best. There were a few options for consumers. But now as you move into more nuanced markets, there are tons of competitors. You look at what used to be available in car companies, a number of cars compared to today, or you know, just the sheer number of software firms filling the customer relationship management field as an example, or social media or anything like that. Tremendous degree of competition and it's standout, you have to have a really differentiated product. 
So you do that analysis, you acquire your market IP, and then you build that into your product. And it's not building your product and then finding out your market IP. I think that's backwards. I think you have to figure out your competitive differentiation right in the beginning, and then you build it into your product. Now you've got something to protect. If you have no difference in your product from what your customer has, you know, Alexis, you can comment on this, but you, I don't, in my view, you don't have anything to protect. You have to have something that's novel, that's useful, that's inventive. And without that, without that differentiation, you can't obtain protection for the differentiation. And therefore you really don't have a competitive advantage at all. And that's the linkage between market IP and, um, and technical IP in my view. Yeah. But Alexis, the, the, this, I'd be interested to hear what you have to say on that. Sometimes though, the methods of that know-how that you're describing are patentable and you can protect in various means. So it, you can't just apply a blanket statement to it to any given business, but often there is a way to protect something that you're not aware of. Um, you know, if we're looking at a physical product that maybe isn't necessarily novel from a, you know, a mechanical perspective, well, perhaps it is novel from a design perspective. And then we look at things like industrial design in Canada, design patents in the US. Um, so there are ways we can go about that. But again, I would agree, you know, on a personal level, not representing CEPO, you know, I don't speak for an organization that you need to consider all of those pieces when you're looking at that. Does that make sense, Charles? Well, except for the last bit, when all I saw was your mouth move, no sounds come out. So if you could just repeat the last bit. I think I was saying I agreed with you that you have to look at, you have to look bigger than a physical object with what you're doing. Yeah, this is true. Um, what then another piece that is across all of them. So not, not that this is going to be the right move for, for many companies, but if you were if you were to exercise, one of your strategies was to, to sell patents that you have. Can you sell, can you market, can you sell market or process IP in the same way that you sell patents? Of course you oh, can. Oh, absolutely. Yeah, go ahead, Alexis. Say more. There's entire businesses that are built around um, the sale and acquisition of patents. You know, they have various terms depending on the circles you're speaking of, but. There are people that do nothing but broker the sale of patents. Um, it's an industry. No and, different from how you sell real estate. And the same thing exists for, for market IP. And effectively, your market IP is your, your customer. Mm -hmm. And you know, if you're acquiring a business, you've got to decide why you're acquiring the business. And there, you know, there are three basic reasons. There are lots of other reasons, but there are three basic reasons you're going to acquire a business. You're going to acquire it because it has a product that you want to sell to your existing customers, or it's got a market that you want to take your product and sell to their customers. And that's because they've got market IP. They've, they've developed a relationship with the market that, that makes that relationship valuable to you with a product that can reach that market. Or convert, lastly, although it doesn't usually bring as much money, they've got a team that is adept at actually doing something and you want to buy them because they might have a lousy product and be in a bad market, but they've got a really good team. And frequently you see teams of developers that are sold. In fact, there's, you, can, you, can, um, you can price teams of developers. And I, I, I went through this a couple of years ago on a certain example where a development team that I was associated with was sold and there was an argument about what's a development team worth. So somehow you're developing each of these, they're each worth different amounts, depending upon what you put into them and what, what intellectual property you manage to create within them. But there are markets for anything that you wanna sell nowadays in that regard. To comment on your um, reference there to talent acquisition, I'm always amazed by how many businesses are amazed when their patent agent or agent lawyer recommends to them to look to the universities that are graduating the bulk of the best talent in their field and start sponsoring those university programs so that they can directly acquire that talent before they're comp. It's all part of the awareness. Yeah, absolutely. And that gets into the strategy of how you're acquiring this, not, not how you're monitoring and monetizing it. But what, I mean, if you've got a really well-developed human resources strategy, 
what you're saying is these are the pieces of intellectual property in market IP and process IP that we need to acquire as a company. And we either we need to acquire the basics of it or we have to acquire the people who can develop it. So you know, it becomes a very conscious strategy. And, and when you're evaluating a team, you can look at the team and say, what have they done before? Therefore, what, what are they bringing in terms of market IP and process IP to the table? And, or what ability have they shown in the past to, to develop that market or process IP? Just the way you look at programmers and what, develop, what abilities they have to develop uh, technical IP. It, it all becomes the same thing. And you, so now IP is more reflected broadly through the organization. Every person in the organization can be an owner of some type of intellectual property. And together, it is the backbone by which the company succeeds and, and, uh, and more holistically looking at the problem. In a lot of organizations, we see that bringing in talent that brings in experience with IP to begin with on the technical side, it creates a competitive but friendly environment within the organization that leads to the generation of even more formal intellectual property, which leads to higher valuations, which leads to more and more and more. Yeah. Um, but if there's no base the cultural understanding of what intellectual property uh, is, you're not going to thrive. I think there's a reason why you see individuals throughout their career with large patent portfolios, right? It's something that they do as they move between different companies. So it's a great point there. I don't think enough people are thinking about that loop, the talent acquisition loop is uh, strategic in that nature. It's a, it's a different lens on particularly technical talent, yeah. but, but business talent as well. So when I teach about intellectual property business strategy, it's not necessarily the terms or the, the, the technical details that we want business leaders to walk away with. We want to imprint on them that the concept of intellectual property and what it means to their business and how they build it up, may it be through building an IP committee or how they're fundamental. Technical stuff after that, they can build upon, um, but they need to have it. The way I come at it is it needs to be ingrained throughout your organization. Yeah, well said. Um, so let's uh, let's take another piece. And, and again, we're, we're getting towards the end of our session. We've got still some time left. There's a number of fairly technical questions that are in the uh, in the chat that we may be able to answer here. Um, they may be more specific to individual companies. Uh, so we'll, we'll look back to those if we can. Please continue to submit those, those questions to the chat uh, or Q&A function and, uh, and we'll address it there. Um, so here, here's a, an attendee question that was submitted. Uh, and I think this is, you know, it's the, the general thing we do as Canadians is compare ourselves to the US, but let, let's do it. Um, what do you mean, I think that Charles's question connects to the paper because it, it says, what do you mean when you say Canadians are patenting more but getting less bang for their buck and why? Well, that's, that's a funny one because I keep doing pieces of research that uh, compare our patenting practices against the results that we're getting. And I've done this two or three times. And the most recent one, I looked at uh, 3,300 companies in the US and Canada in artificial intelligence, biotechnology, and a few others. I can't remember exactly what. And I looked at the number of patents held by each of those 3,300 companies, how much capital they'd received in total. And what I, what I noticed is that the Canadians, actually there were more Canadians as a percentage that held patents than Americans that held patents. We're talking about US patents here, not Canadian patents. So if you look at 100 Canadian companies, uh, they had more of them were getting patents than there were American companies, 100 American companies getting patents. And the second thing is they had more patents per dollar of capital than the Americans did. American patents again. So what this means to me is that the, the, they aren't raising the same amount of money with their patent portfolio than the, uh, as the Americans are raising. And when you don't raise as much money, what typically happens is you don't grow as fast, you don't develop the valuations, you don't have the chance to go public. So in, when I say they're not getting the bang for the buck, they're doing the patenting. But uh, one stat from another piece of research, is when you look at series A rounds, foreigners invest in Canada 
uh, 2.7 times as much as Canadian VCs invest in Series A rounds per company. So a company that gets financed in Canada uh, by Canadians has you know, 40% of the money that a Canadian company financed by the US have. When you get financed like that, you have uh, more money to lose, more money to spend on sales and marketing, you're gonna have faster growth, in the long run, you're gonna get a, a better valuation and more chance of going public. So when you look at bang for the buck, we are doing the patenting. I would argue against many, many reports that look globally at Canada and say, you know, we're not doing enough R&D patenting in business. The problem is that we have a different business composition in Canada. We have a lot more small firms. I think we're second last in the OECD in terms of large firms as a percentage of population. Small firms tend to patent less than large firms. And so when you look at it as a country, you can look at R&D and say we're failing, but you have to ask the question, where is that failure happening? I don't see it happening in the technical technology industry because the, every time I do the stats, I see that the same rate of patenting in technology in Canada is in the US, but we're not growing the bigger big companies. The end result, we're not getting the bang for the buck for the patenting that we're doing, pointing to the fact that the problem in Canada is not patenting, the problem is marketing and the process behind growing large companies. I'll, I'll add to that a little bit. Often what I see, and I know many of the professionals that I work with, um, agents and agent lawyers, they comment on it all the time, is businesses patenting for the wrong reasons and patenting the wrong things that they're working on. And that also ends up poorly for Canada. So if we go back, and I know I'm saying this ad nauseum here, but if we, if we go back and we basically focus on, we have an education gap. We have businesses that associate intellectual property all the time with just patents. And that's great because we do need patents. But if we're not doing it for the right reasons and understanding what we're doing, it doesn't help the situation. So you know, when I look at, the, when I listen to what you're saying, Charles, to me, it's just, this is an educational challenge that we're having. It's not unique necessarily to Canada, but we definitely have a problem with it. Yeah, and I think today was really interesting because the logic brought out uh, the Autumn Report. The Autumn Report says, I can't remember the dollar value. I mean, universities are doing $4.5 billion worth of, uh, of research a year, and the total dollar value of, of uh you know, money earned from the patents that are created is infinitesimal in comparison to the $4.5 billion. And this is another case of we're doing the patenting, we're not getting the, reaping the rewards. Well, there are a number of reasons behind that. And oddly enough, they came back, come back to the same things as I'm trying to point out in this paper, is that it's a lack of understanding of market IP and uh, process IP. First of all, the universities are not tasked, they do not have a mandate to commercialize the the intellectual property they create, which is the first problem. The second problem is that the intellectual property being created is not being created by demand in the marketplace, it's being created by interest. And that's as it should be because they're universities. So a lot of the stuff that is created in universities is not, is not you know, marketable in the first place because it wasn't designed to be marketable and I'm not criticizing that. But there are some things that may be designed to be marketable, but universities in Canada are not given at all the same money to market the results of the patents that they create. They're, so they're not given the money to do the patents. So when you look at the patenting rate in Canada versus US, it's abysmal in Canada, but the Canadian universities aren't given the money to do the patents because that's not part of their mandate. Then when they actually do the patents, they're not given the ability through capital to commercialize those patents. What, what they're given is, uh, you know, they're told, yeah, it'd be nice if you commercialize it, but their way of commercializing it for all they can afford is to license it. And typically that happens to large foreign corporations. So we have a situation where we say, yeah, we're spending a lot in R&D, but we're not putting behind that the understanding of the market and the money behind the marketing and the process knowledge that turns that intellectual property into something. And so it's, I think it's unfair to criticize the universities for this. It doesn't have the mandate. They don't have the funding and they don't have the knowledge to do it. And that's why we're putting out this paper to make people understand that there's more than just patenting to the creation of successful enterprises. It's applying market knowledge and process knowledge to the fueling of growth and the creation of large scale enterprises. And I think Charles, I'm just gonna bring back, this connects to a, an attendee question as well. I think you just answered it, which is the, the context for 
market IP and, and process IP, I think it's fair to say based on your answer. So why, why use those terms? Really the context here is about elevating their importance to the same level as technical IP and that they're considered both on their independent value, but also as a whole. I may be putting words in your mouth, but just wanted to circle back on that. Yeah, no, that's, that's completely fair. I mean, yeah, yeah, the, the question is, um, is specifically, oh, it just disappeared. So I was going to read the specific question, but um, hey, can you get it back there? Because it's a- I can, uh, I can read it out to you. Sure. So, it's, so why introduce the terms of market and process IP if they're not currently known? So why introduce those to the conversation? Well, that's what innovation is. Innovation is introducing new ideas and new products to the marketplace. Uh, and we need to innovate to meet the needs of a changing society. And so all we're doing is we're starting a new conversation. And that's what universities are told to do. That $4.5 billion or whatever it was in research is universities that are introducing new concepts into the world. They're examining what exists. They're critiquing it. They're saying, this is how it's working. This is how it's not working. And they're saying, oh, we see a new lens for doing this. And then universities, they go to peer review, peer review journals, they get evaluated by their peers and they publish and there's a discourse that happens. So we are trying to create a discourse. We're trying to start a conversation here from a different lens and a different perspective. And yeah, that's going to involve using terms that haven't been used before. And people invent terms all the time. They invent products all the time. I mean, saying why, why would you bother exist inventing a new product when somebody's never heard of it? Well, that, that seems sort of like anti-innovative. But what we're trying to do here is start a discourse that challenges Canada because Canada has had for 50 to 75 years, one of the worst rates in uh, productivity improvement, in business R&D, in creation of large companies, in creation of unicorns, and it hasn't changed. No matter how much money is applied, and there's billions of dollars a year applied in Canada to solve these problems. And I can go back to Global Nails from 50 years ago and see the same articles that exist today. Canada invents five new programs to deal with R&D, Canada invents a new patenting policy to deal with R&D, and we have the same problem. The reason is we're looking at the same problems, the same old ways as we always have. It's time to change that conversation and look at things in a new way. I'll get off uh, my screen. I will challenge that and defend it a little bit as a federal public servant. <laughs> I see behind the scenes how actively we are working to establish new and innovative programs that do line up with national IP strategies, et cetera. And, you know, even when we look at, uh, you know, prime intellectual property and what we're seeing at the province, which isn't my employer, but they're making really, really good steps to move forward with it, um, that they are, you know, there is movement, but it is difficult because, and this maybe goes back to terminology, and this is speaking as a daughter um, of a woman that, was not born in Canada. Um, I'm first born Canadian, English as a second language in my family. It's about, we have a language problem. So we have R&D teams that have adopted just the patenting language around it. And you have within business, you have executives and other buckets that are afraid of that terminology. So when we teach it, sometimes language that I used in school to address these different departmentals uh, within an organization. So part of it is trying to get more people to take ownership of the subject matter. I don't really see it as an, you know, as an attack on terminology. I see it as we're trying to more holistically bring in more Canadian innovators to own the subject matter. Um, and that's kind of the lens I look at it. I think that's great. Both both two sides that, that I think kind of contribute to the same. So one is adding to the conversation, contributing new value. Also love the point about the utility of language, right? And this idea relates back to where we started the conversation on culture and, and making it seem that this isn't one team or one person's job and responsibility from IP, but it's an organizational you know, uh, imperative that you have to have. So that's great. So I'm realizing we're, we're yes. just flown by. Um, I know we've got another, we've got just about five minutes to wrap here. Alexis, if you had a quick comment, I'll, I'll, I'll let you put a comment to that. Yeah, I did. As much as we want, you know, executive teams to adopt the conversation 
manifestation of intellectual property and the subject matter, I do think business responsibility at an executive level of someone that does oversee it all. So oh, yeah. moving away from this just within R&D to, you know, this is a C-suite level individual within our leading organizations across the country. I would really, really, on a personal level, love to see more of that because I pretty sure the data would show that it would create some more success. It's good, uh, good management practice there. Um, so I'm going to, I'm going to turn, uh, one question, uh, in our time. I know there are some more, again, I'll, I'll advise people, jo people join throughout the hour. Uh, if you have questions, you want to follow up with Alexis and, and Charles, you can reach out to your advisor and your CSM. Uh, as a way to, to as a conduit to, to get answers to those questions. So this is a bit of our, our, our lead maybe in the next week in our AMA. We didn't talk about data. So where does data fit into this picture of, of uh, IP 2.0? And I'll open that up to both of you. Can I answer this one, Charles? Go Can for I it. Start, Charles, is that okay with you? Yeah, 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 okay, go for it. So I'm not a yeah, I'm not an expert in the subject area, but what I am an expert at is looking at the leading uh, perspectives in a subject matter and paying attention to what they're saying. So a trend I'm noticing within the profession that does work within the data framework of intellectual property is it is all about the process, which is typically contractual, right? What you're doing to own that data, where you're getting it, how you're getting it, all the rules and ethics and, you know, all the legal side of it that goes with it. And then on the other side of that, it's protecting, knowing what you're going to do with it in the event of cybersecurity. Um, and that is the two common themes that I'm hearing around intellectual property. So that know-how of how to manage the data from a contractual perspective and everything else that I just mentioned, you know, that also fits into know-how, trade secrets, intellectual property, process IP. Whatever language we're applying to it, data and intellectual property definitely go together. And, and, and you know, I, I, I should be faulted for not including this in the discussion but, uh, and in the paper, but fundamentally data exists at the bottom layer as underpinning all of these uh, functions of technical IP, market IT and process IP. So, you know, a good example is a company in, involved in machine learning has data that is embedded in the product. Uh, a company like Uber has significant uh, volume of data and Google, there's a great example, significant knowledge about the market that is embedded in their organization and they gain knowledge as to what to do and how to apply that through ownership of that data. And they also have knowledge of the process. And so they know what it takes and uh, in terms of going to customers, uh, developing leads, developing uh, uh, conversations and developing long-term uh, financial commitments with customers because of the data they've got. And so when you look at it, the role of data scientists has been elevated in many, many companies. And in fact, the role of economists has been elevated in companies. You look at the large US companies, they're all now employing economists and data scientists in order to understand and grapple with the data. Because economics is fundamentally the process of uh, production, distribution, and consumption of goods and services. And it's data about that that leads you to technical IP, market IP, and process IP. And it becomes more of an embodiment now. Well, I'm going to have to end it there. Again, great answers. I think a really valuable hour. I know for us, this is a conversation that's going to be gone, ongoing with more to come on the topic and, and more opportunities, I'm sure, for a dialogue. So we're at our hour. I'm going to close by saying thank you for everyone for joining us in this uh, AMA session. Really want to thank uh, Alexis and Charles for joining us. It was great to have you with us. Uh, have a great week, everyone. Uh, I hinted at data. Where we're looking at the privacy angle of data, a different lens on data next week uh, in our next AMA on Tuesday, January 26th, and we hope you can join us. Take care, everyone. Thanks, Ian. Thank you. Thank you, Ian. Thanks, Alexis.